You're welcome back. Well, we have the uh, BVAS and electronic transmission of results on election day. These are things new to our electoral process. In 2019, there was a lot of noise as to whether there was electronic transmission or not. In fact, one of the presidential candidates was allegedly strong electronically, if I may put it that way, until the electoral body, that is INEC, came out to say there was nothing like electronic transmission of results. Well, tech is here to stay now, and we are wondering how much of this can be homegrown and what kind of policies can make this come to be. Oladi Pupo Polaji is a digital product manager, and he joins us now. Good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. I'm uh, excited to be here. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, everybody's excited in Nigeria, especially in this election, because, uh, like I said, uh, there was no electronic transmission of elections before now. There was no BVAS. So technology has entered our electoral process. And a lot of people are saying this might just be the turning point for Nigeria to have a free and fair election. But we, don't, we still don't seem to know the importance of technology in Nigeria. As a digital expert, as a technological expert, uh, give us um, just an insight as to how important technology is to Nigeria's economy as a whole. Yeah, thank you. So technology has come to stay and it has uh, permeated every aspect of our life, from our phones, from the way we communicate. Uh, in fact, Everything around us, homes, school, hospital, everywhere, we, we are now in an era of digital transformation, mm -hmm. if we can say that. So, so it's not new to now see different government agencies deploying technology for different activities. Mm -hmm. So and what are the drivers that is uh, pushing technology, especially in Nigeria? So if you look at the future of technology in Nigeria, it's very bright because we have demographics, we have young people, mm. and young people that we have are mostly, we call them digital natives. So they were born to operate smartphone. Yeah. I don't know about you, but if you yeah, see... Yeah, we, we were the... The digital alien. <laughs> no, no, we call, we call ourselves BBC, born before computers. So <laughs> we came at the time the computers were not there, but we're grappling with it and trying to just uh, fit in. But right now, from the look of things, I don't know if I'm wrong, but you are the expert. From the look of things, uh, the youths that are mo mostly into technology may not have had that opportunity from where, when they should have had the opportunity. It's just something they have grown to meet and they're doing their best to fit into the technological world, you know. But can they not, can they not be something that the country can do, the policies that can be done to make sure that it is available to everybody, not just because you have a friend that has a smartphone and you're learning and all that, because there seem to be challenges and we have not even seen what kind of things that we can use technologies to do in Nigeria. I, I, I agree with you. 100% plus one, if that is possible, because while I was in school studying computer science, the only place you can say computer is at the computer lab, mm. right? And some people graduate uh, from school without uh, actually touching a computer. But all that is changing now. Uh, we, the devices are becoming more affordable. We have a lot of startups, uh, you know, promoting uh, those innovations, training, and, and all that. So I think the government also needs to support in terms of policy, have uh, more digital incubation centers where people can go to and be able to have access to those physical devices because all people actually need is a way to experience those technology and interact with it. Mm. Nigerians are smart people. Just give them that small opportunity they will make, they will, be, they will show their creativity and you will be amazed at that. So we need more investment in technology. We need investment also in infrastructure. Recently, you see what we've been going through using a uh, ATM card yeah. to pay digital payment transfer, not going network, because we are, all of a sudden we are having increase in you know, transaction. Yeah. So we need that capacity to be able to undo that. And that capacity will come from government because 
uh, there's only so much private investment can do. So in terms of uh, laying fiber cable, those infrastructure, right of way for operators in that industry, lowering some of those costs, then exchange rates, so be, because we are still, let's face it, we are still mm. import dependent company, yeah, uh, yeah. country anyway. So, and as we are having those fluctuations in exchange ma uh, rate markets, is actually not promoting investment in that sector as it should be. So if we could have that, uh, if businesses can plan to know this is the exchange rate and this is the things, this is government policy, at least for now, it's not going to change. And if it's going to change, we're going to have adequate information as to why it's going to change. We're going to be consulted as stakeholders. People can plan and we can begin to see investment in that sector. Like I mentioned earlier, the drivers are there. We have talent pool, people who are very talented, ready to work, young demography. We also have the market size. We are 180 million plus people. And uh, our language of instruction is English, which is a good market for yeah. technology. Yeah. So, so we have all that. We just need that enabling environment that we always talk about and those yeah. are those are the policies yeah. that needs to come in terms of education mm. stem education so we need to start learning coding at, from young but not just learning it we need infrastructure where people can you know go and practice and be able to innovate and uh, so when that is at scale, we begin to see local solutions to our problems. So, so that's actually possible, that we can have local solutions to our problem, to the standard uh, obtainable anywhere in the world. Sure. Just when we have the enabling environment. Sure, because if you, if, you, if you look at it, every big companies, tech companies, and everywhere in the world that you can find, you find Nigerians there also doing amazing things. Mm. So what's the difference? Environment enabling infrastructure, environment, local support, especially at the universities. So we need our educational institutions to be up and be able to provide those uh, uh, curriculum, curriculum that are centered around, centered the around technology. technology and what is happening now. So we don't want a situation where it's good to understand the history of where we are coming from, especially in computer science and go. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we need to start teaching things that will make people ready for markets. So the banks and everybody are complaining that people are jackpying, that they are, they are technology mm -hmm. experts are living abroad and co. So that creates an opportunity for employment for tech people. But already are, are graduates to be able to fill that space. So that's the question we need to, that's why we need to upgrade our curriculum to be sure that as they are finishing school, they are ready to the market. No, let, let me just see, you know, on Saturday we're going to the polls and hopefully we're going to have a new president. Uh, it must be a new president because the, the present administration cannot go back. So it's, everything is going to be new, whether it's from the same party or a different party, but the figurehead is going to be new. Now, if you had the opportunity to advise him on things to do first, to make sure that technology flourishes, because everything, even farming now is technology, yeah. education, everything is tied to technology. And if we don't start a deliberate attempt to make sure that we put the things that we need in place, we might not get to where we need to get to. So if you were to advise, let's say the president now, what are the first things you would say they should look into as policies that will enable technology flourish well in Nigeria? Yeah, we can't overemphasize uh, infrastructure. So infrastructure is key, but, now, let's, let, but let's break Yes, let's break it down. down, yeah. So we need uh, telecommunication infrastructure. So okay. we need that expansion in that area. So it could be a way of uh, giving people more licenses to do that, to come and invest in that space, I don't know. But we need that telecommunication infrastructure, very important. We've been able to manage our way around power, 
least we're having alternate power, solar, and coal, but it's still very expensive. So if we can get more done in terms of uh, uh, grid electricity, that would be fine. Then another thing that is also, I think, low-hanging fruit that uh, we can begin to also do is uh, to begin to address some issues by, poly by way of policy. So one, um, getting our uh, uh, MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies to patronize local solution provider, for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you could say that uh, um, our solution may not be that uh, beautiful in terms of the user experience, but if you don't give us that opportunity, it will not get better. Mm -hmm. So we can, at least in, when we are forming those projects in, um, whatever, in that contract, ensure that there's a local partner in that. So the local partner could be handling the back end, while the more advanced or foreign partners are handling the front end, or the local partner could be handling the front end, back end, the foreign partner could be handling the security part of things till we develop that capacity to be able to do that. So another thing also that we can begin to do is to have policies that support cloud uh, deployment. So when you deploy some of your infrastructure in cloud, the cloud has what you call agility can scale. Mm -hmm. So when you are eating it with uh, uh, traffic, it scales. Of course, you're going to pay more during that period, but you're going to satisfy your customer. Mm -hmm. So what that means really is that your transfer will never fail. Oh, so I, I knew you had to bring that in. Cash yeah, scarcity. yeah, because yeah. I, yeah, I, I knew I spent like two hours on queue yesterday trying to try different uh, ATM card transfer and all that. So, if we have some of those infrastructure deploy in cloud, uh, just a matter of configuration, they will scale and be able to at least withstand this initial the traffic, uh, traffic that we're experiencing then we can't overemphasize education. So we need education, not only learning what to do, but also learning best practices. Mm. So we need international partnership. At so what point do we start that uh, education? Because um, I don't know if the, the primary school you attended, you had opportunity of seeing a computer in school. But um, and you, go, you went to the university, you studied uh, computer sciences. Yeah, so there are a lot of people that they have a dream. They want to be computer experts, and they want to do it in, this, in the university. But in this case, if we want this our society to be uh, technology compliant, I don't know if that's the word I will yeah, use. Right. Where do we start from? Because when we're changing the curriculum, how do we change it? Do we change from from bottom up or from top bottom, how do we change it or everything? So we need to go from bottom up, top down. I don't understand. So top being the tertiary level, mm. so that needs to change. And what needs to change there may not really be in terms of the CSC 107, 108. It's just to be sure that those contents are things that we are teaching are market ready and relevant. So those uh, theories, they are very good. They are the foundation of computer science. Those uh, mathematics and those art subjects, they are very good. But we need to bring it home. We now have the opportunity to, to find use cases all around us. So it's no longer esoteric as to what is all this gibberish that mm. this professor is talking about. So we need, educate, we need to change at that level then bottom up also from kindergarten. So that's what I mean by bottom up. Because from age one, our young ones are already interacting with computers anyway. The smartphone is a computer. Yeah. So that means that we need to start teaching them what is coding, what is computer, how things work. And there are also programming languages at their level that are just drag and drop. They can use to create cartoon. They can use to do animation and co. By the time you start exposing their mind at that level to that possibility of things they can create, even while in school, while in secondary school, they will start uh, creating things, because, uh, uh, owning a company, 
forming start startup, teaching them businesses and entrepreneurship, you begin to see that you don't need to study computer science to be able to play in the digital space. Well, it's it's I, I don't know when 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 I first had an interaction with computers, we were like um, 350 in a class, and there was one computer. I had you are not alone. <laughs> I had a, a very long note, very big note that we were we were writing. What is a mouse? We will define mouse like five pages of a mouse without touching it. And I discovered that after all this, I really didn't need all the, the verbiage. I didn't need all the, the words that were given to me as book. I could have just touched the mouse. And you tell me right click is this way, left click is this way. And because we didn't have access to that, I finished that course without knowing anything about a computer. I kept reading it, and I didn't recognize it. I didn't know anything about a computer. Now, this brings us to the, the cost of doing what you're proposing. If the government wants to do the kind of things that you're proposing, is it in this day and age, I'm not talking about when I started learning it, but in this day and age, is it that costly to infuse these things you're talking about in our curriculum and teach in schools? Speaking about costs, I would say yes and no. So no in the sense that uh, we can just, you know, in computer there is control C, control V. At yeah. least you should be able to remember mm -hmm. that. I remember that. Copy and paste. Yeah. So we can just copy and paste. So we have uh, very good examples abroad. In fact, some of their curriculums are even open source. That means you can, from the social media, learn some of those things. So universities like Stanford, Harvard, some of those big universities have, uh, under the open courseware arrangement, released their curriculum. And even some, some of them, they are full classes online. So we can just copy and paste. So that way, it's not very expensive to implement. Mm -hmm. Of course, in terms of training and getting those infrastructures available, getting the bandwidth to all our universities and uh, educational institutions, getting power available, you know, uh, being able to have uh, hosting infrastructure because when you finish whatever you're doing, you need to host it somewhere on a mm -hmm. server somewhere. And that server, you need to pay for it. So although we are not having local host steam company in the country, which we need we to. We do? Yes, we do. We have uh, three of them that I'm very aware of, and they are very reliable. Um, yeah, uh, they're reliable. Are they also um, affordable? They're affordable in the sense that you pay now. So you don't need to struggle for FX to pay all your foreign counterparts, mm, nice. counterparts rather. So they... So we need to encourage them to be able to scale up and be able to serve this local market that we have. So that is the area where you're going to have investment. Mm. But to just jumpstart, you just copy and paste. Okay. Now, uh, the electoral system, we're, we're excited that technology has entered. So uh, before we wrap up, let's just, let's just look at it. People are excited about BVAS. People are excited about electronic vote, um, not voting, uh, electronic transmission of results. But can there be a time where we can develop to the extent that we can have electronic voting as well? Because I would want to vote in my village because one of the reasons I'm in Lagos may be that things are not working well the way they should work in my local government. And I need to vote in someone that I think can change the, the story and all that. So I, can, I need to be able to vote even from Lagos for my uh, candidate back home and anywhere I am in the world. So with technology, that's what people have been asking, that's what people have been hoping for, but I don't know how feasible that is. Is it possible that one day we can grow, especially with all these suggestions you've given to the next administration, to the extent that we could have electronic voting? And then in answer to that one, I want to tie it to the fact that we have BVAS and uh, electronic transmission of uh, votes. Does that give you any more... Um, 
confidence than you have had before in our electoral process. Okay, so uh, talking about voting electronically, I think uh, you already do that today. Do we? Yes, surveys. You feel surveys online, right? Yes, but, but election so, voting we can't. So that's the same principle, right? So you have something to check and you click on it mm -hmm. and you get your result. So when you move it to the realm of politics, so it may just be whatever the political arrangement, uh, the political uh, arrangement is, that may be the reason why you may not be able to have it or you may have it. So I don't know so much about that <laughs> terrain. But when it comes to the principle of it, we already so that do it's that. Achievable so jam, the students mm -hmm. that are writing jams write uh, CBT exams. They just click and click and click and they get their results. So, so the, the technology itself, the principle itself, we are already interacting with it. Mm, interesting. So it's just the political will, as it were, to implement something like that for voting. Maybe. But how about rigging of that kind of a system? Is it possible? Okay, so um, your financial transactions mm. can be exposed to fraudulent activities, right? Yeah. So you have scammers and co. So anything that is electronic, you know, that's why you have what you call data security, information security. So it depends on the level of your IT security. So, of course, you can break into systems. And that's why you also have practices that help to prevent those things. And in technology, there's this balance between security and ease of use. So, mm. so you, you're adding your infrastructure so that at least to, to ensure that uh, it's uh, secured. So uh, humans are the weakest link in any technology. Mm. So if you take care of the human factor, your technology is secure. Oh, okay. So, BVAS, electronic transmission, let's talk generally about this election. Does it give you more confidence now than you had before? Or you think it's just a failed state and nothing, will go nothing good will come out of it, whether technology or no technology? I have no opinion in that here. <laughs> My man is trying to be careful. But at least you have, you have said that whatever we've been dreaming of, of is affordable, um, achievable rather. Yeah, so te technology enhances transparency, no doubt. And you have audit trails, you can get things. But, you know, um, sometimes in many places, technology works best when it's not political. Why would you say that? Yeah, because of uh, the, so all the interest that comes around it. So, so it's always, so in banking, technology is working fine. So. I know, I know about that in fintech, I know about that, but that or that terrain, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, there is a lot of abracadabra when it comes to uh, politics. Well, but we are hoping that gradually we'll get to that point where transparency, because of technology, will have the, such transparency that whoever comes to the throne, as it were, we will believe that it was the people who spoke and installed whoever it is. And that alone helps to make the people have confidence in the government and feel a sense of belonging and feel a sense of ownership so that they can support the government as well. But for so far, I think we will thank God for small messes that at least we have the beavers and all that. A final word to the people, especially the youths who might want to venture into, into technology and feel that the terrain is still too harsh for them. You are in it, you survived it. <laughs> so uh, uh, let them know some yeah. things. There's never a better time to get into tech than now. Mm. You have a lot of uh, inform opportunities. The social media, the internet is there. You can learn anything just at the cost of data. So once you can get data on the phone. And uh, I'll just advise them, follow technology experts online, they are always ready to share, always ready to mentor, always ready to give back. So uh, now they have everything to succeed, actually, mm. everything. Yeah. They have the people contact, and we're also having companies now around us 
that are even big tech companies not opening shop in the country. So that's, an, uh, uh, that's also another advantage. And it's also an area where you can sit down here and get remote opportunity. So you can earn in FA foreign, FA Naira, uh, uh, foreign currency while even in the country. So it's never, this is the very best time for them to take that opportunity. And you don't need to study STEM sciences mm. to be able to take that opportunity. So we have different career in tech, product management, user researcher, coder, project managers, and all that. So even if you are humanities, if you study psychology, if you study sociology, you have a role to play in tech because tech is about people. Mm. Uh, well, um, <clears throat> for the political magicians, uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, Lady Pupo just said that uh, tech works better where it is not, it doesn't have uh, politics involved in it. But we're getting there. And right now, we're proud that our electoral system has some form of tech, which is giving us this confidence that it will be a free and fair election. At least it will be transparent enough for us to uh, see it as being free and fair. We've been talking with uh, Oladipupo Bolaji, who is a tech expert here with us today. And he's been giving us insight into the importance of tech and what the next administration needs to do to make sure technology or that sector of our economy flourishes. Thank you so much, Oladi Pupo, for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Okay, we'll take a short break. And when we return, remember that recently we spoke with a legal practitioner. We tried to x-ray the actions of the court and the actions of the Kaduna State Governor El Rufai concerning the CBN or con countering the CBN and even the president's directive over the Naira scarcity. Barrister Abumere Osara, legal practitioner and notary public, spoke with us. Stay with us when we return. We'll bring you that clip.